Good morning, watershed. Play some Miley Cyrus because that's what I'm going to start with this morning. But I hopped off the plane at LAX with my dream. Does anybody know the lyrics? And my cardigan and one suitcase, just one. I was old, small town dreamer to her California to jumping off the LA metro. Do I need, do I need to switch to the handheld? <laughs> Hold that thought. Just keep singing Miley Cyrus in your head. Okay. So I was a 26-year-old small town dreamer who went from listening to her California mix CD to jumping off of the LA Metro and being greeted by the sweetest local wanderer sitting at the front gate of the apartment complex that I would call my new home. I was on the hero's journey. I didn't realize it at the time, but it's true. I was doing it. I had been a director of youth ministry at a Baptist church for three and a half years at that point. And I had this feeling deep in my gut that I was supposed to be in church ministry full time. So I answered the call to adventure to attend seminary and get my master's degree in theology. I crossed the literal threshold to the West Coast. And in that, I was completely transformed. I fell in love with urban living, the lights, the smells even, the people, the food, everything that made it what it was. The president of the seminary at our convocation, he spoke and he compared this season of life to the end of a flight on an airplane. He said, just like the items in the overhead bins will shift during flight, the same thing is about to happen in your lives. None of you will go back to the world you left and be the same. Joseph Campbell, creator of the hero's journey, says that transformed by experience, the hero returns to the community with gift bearing hands. This was me. My experience working at a Los Angeles homeless shelter with families and walking along under-resourced and disconnected students had rocked me to my core. I had learned more about bed bugs and more about mandated reporting than I ever wanted to. But it was through these encounters and experiences that everything inside of me shifted completely. My eyes were opened. I honestly don't know how else to say it besides I felt like I had finally encountered the mystery, depth, and goodness of the divine that I had read about for years in scripture. I want to press pause on my story here, and I want to look at it through the hero's journey stages. So I had ventured from the ordinary world into an unknown world. I had experienced a death and a rebirth, which is part of what happens. And I had been transformed by my experiences and encounters. I felt like I had finally made my meaning, my purpose, and figured out what fueled my life. And friends, this is exactly what Joseph Campbell says the whole point of the hero's journey is. The hero's journey is the idea of a life lived in pursuit of realizing one's inborn potential, breaking free from the boundaries of social stigma, authority, tradition. The call is the prompt for the hero to rise from the dream state of village life into an active experiential awareness and inquiry. The pursuit of realizing one's inborn potential. Making life's meaning is not what we find if we follow a treasure map, but it's actually what sustains us along that journey. It is what helps us thrive when things are good and cope 
when things are hard? And why is it valuable? Why does it mean anything for us to engage this whole idea of making meaning? Because studies actually show that we can tolerate any amount of suffering if it has meaning, if we know the purpose behind it. So what do we do to pursue life's meaning? You have to make it. We have to know what matters to us. What is worth it? What do we want so much that we're willing to give up everything else? Will, will I be able to respect myself if I don't pursue this? And then you have to engage it. We know that leafy greens make us more healthy, but they only make us more healthy if we engage them and eat them. And it's the same thing with this. Research tells us that meaning is not just a coping strategy, but it promotes health. It's not about fun or pleasure, but it's about becoming our best self. Meaning gives our life significance, and meaning is powerful. So powerful that there is research that says that people who engage their meaning have 17% lower risk of all causes of mortality. Now, some of you have stressed out in the last few minutes because you're thinking, I don't know what my meaning is. But there's three possibilities that maybe can help you think through this. The first is what pursuit or achievement do you want to be your legacy? The second, if you're interested in serving the divine, then that would be the second question maybe you could engage with. And the third, what makes you feel lovingly, emotionally, and intimately connected to others? We thrive when we are answering the call of something larger than ourselves. When all the commuting is done, the laundry is done, our inbox is at zero, the texts are responded to, the diapers are changed, the kids are fed, we've worked out. What has a meaning larger than the grind of the daily routine? So this morning, I want you to ask yourself, what am I doing when I feel most powerful? What is my something larger? There are a few people before us that leaned into their meaning. There's Audre Lorde, who was a poet and queer activist, and she said, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength and the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. Then there's Malala Yousafzai. I raise up my voice not so I can shout, but so that those without a voice can be heard. Then we have Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman who was ever elected to US Congress. She said, service to others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. Then there's Chelsea Manning, known as the whistleblower, who said sometimes you have to pay a heavy price to live in a free society. And then there's Malcolm X, civil rights activist, says a human who stands for nothing will fall for anything. These are people who identified their meaning and they, com they committed to pursuing it and engaging it no matter what. But I'm a realistic person, so of course I know there are obstacles to engaging in our meaning. We live in a world that values transactional relationships. And what I mean by this is our world values what we can give as opposed to who we are becoming. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but we just figured out this other virus, but there's actually another virus that's out there. It's called human giver syndrome. Human giver syndrome perpetuates itself even if it kills the host in the process. And there's no mask that prevents it from spreading. There's only a choice that we make individually and collectively 
to be and value humans becoming, not humans giving. There's a well-known parable in scripture about his dad and his two sons. Most of you have probably heard this story before. And if you grew up in church, it was always used to teach forgiveness and about how we should act when a sinner recognizes their ways and returns to the church. But today I wanna look at this passage through the lens of the hero's journey. I want us to look at the dad and sons more closely. I want you to see the difference between a human giver and a human becomer. So if you will, we're gonna to read together Luke 15, 11 through 32. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what is going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years, I have been the one slaving for you and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. In this story, we don't know much about the internal struggles of the son that left, but let's assume he embarked on this hero's journey that we keep talking about. Let's assume he wanted to venture out of his village, leave the ordinary, and go through his own transformative process into the unknown. And his return, scheduled or not, was received and processed in two very different ways. His parents celebrated. His older brother was ticked off. These reactions were rooted in two very different understandings of the way that we see relationships and value. The parent chose to value this human, this son who was becoming. The parent who symbolizes God in this story gave the space for the brother to venture out, to cross the threshold, to face the trials, to die to self, and to find union with the divine. 
And then he returned. But the older brother was infected with human giver syndrome. He was so angry. He had followed the rules. He was resentful. He had given up his life to stay there. He had colored in the lines. He had checked the boxes in the list. He had done all the right things. He appeared perfect on the outside. He was the good kid. He's the kid from elementary school that's yelling, get back in line. What's wrong with you? Behave yourself. Follow the rules. But did any of that matter? Back to my story and the hero's journey. We stopped where I said I felt like I had finally encountered the mystery, depth, and goodness of the divine. And I wanted everyone to experience this revelation, this atonement or at one minute. So after almost six years in Los Angeles, I humbly and enthusiastically returned ready to share my heart. But you know what? The ones I returned to, they didn't want that. Not collectively or individually. I didn't return to my community as a hero. Was I loved? Yes, I believe that in the best way that they know how to love. Was my community of friends and family glad I was back? Absolutely. But Blair as a hero? Not even close. I was labeled as the liberal ruined by those California sinners. I was a woman in ministry who wanted to be more than just a children's director. I chose leaving and education and singleness over the same old formula that everyone else had followed. I felt more alienated and more alone than ever. So I did what any good Christian girl would do. I listened to what all those people told me. I questioned everything I had discovered about myself and I left church ministry. I stepped into a public school classroom as a first grade teacher so that I could still walk alongside kids and families. I let go of my own meaning to avoid conflict, to be a people pleaser, and to get back in line. So the question that keeps gnawing at me as we go through this hero's journey is what happens when the hero returns and they're not seen as a hero? What happens when the ones you return to don't want these gift-bearing hands? What happens when they only want your answers, not your questions? What happens when they don't want to hear your knowledge because it doesn't support their ideas? What happens when they don't want their society or community or family or church or schools to be changed? What happens when your parents or family don't agree with your parenting style? What happens when they don't agree with your lifestyle choices, relationship choices, job choices? What happens when they don't care if systems value all of humanity? What happens when they don't support your divorce? What happens when they don't agree with anti-racist work that you are committed to? What happens when they don't want to tear down this house, their ideas of God that were built on shame, fear, toxic control, and rebuild it in love and grace and celebration of becoming? What happens when you choose to trust yourself instead of the cultural systems that are in place? What happens when you choose to value becoming over giving? What happens when you really engage with your meaning? I don't have any answers, 
But I will tell you that in my experience, what happened to me was number one, you're not always seen as a hero. When I came back from California seminary, from my journey, and not just me, but even the people I listed earlier, Malala, Chelsea, Malcolm, Audrey, Shirley, people responded like the dad. I mean, like the brother, not like the dad. People said, what is wrong with you? Get back in line. People want certainty. They want statements that end in periods and exclamation points. But I'm a comma lover. I'm a semicolon lover. I'm an ellipses lover, a question mark lover. Because friends, I don't know about you, but the more that I learn, the more I realize I don't know. I've had to let the expectation of the hero title go in my profession, in my relationships, in the ways I show up in this world. I've had to make my meaning mine, not my family's or friends or strangers' meaning that they have assigned to me. And it feels so lonely sometimes. This is why communities like Watershed are important. We are together awakening and struggling and loving as though a different world is possible today. We're a community trying to move from being human givers to human becomers. We trust that God, the divine, is inviting us into making and engaging our meaning, constantly reminding us, you are always with me and all that is mine is also yours. So what's the point? That's the point. In leaning into our meaning, in choosing to be human becomers, in choosing to trust, we create a better world for all. And I would argue that this is the gospel. This is the place where our egos dissolve, where we connect, and where we celebrate our universal non-belonging. I close today with an invitation for all of us. Watershed, let's be people who are committed to become and to encourage others to become. Let's be a community that anticipates and celebrates how our meaning can change this world. Let's be ellipsis people, not period people. Let's be the space where egos can dissolve. Let's be a community where we find union with the divine. You are all so deeply loved and each of your hearts is necessary. You are good, you are enough. Let's engage our meaning and let's get out of line together. Go in peace this week.